In this chapter, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the respiratory system. So what is the role of the respiratory system? Well, as you probably already know, it supplies oxygen to the tissues. Another role is it removes CO2 from the body. It's also responsible for our sense of smell. And lastly, our ability to speak. So in order to carry out these roles, the respiratory system must carry out four distinct processes or functions. The first one is simply to move air in and out of the lungs, and that's called pulmonary ventilation. Also known as breathing. Once the gases from the air enter the lungs, they need to move into the blood vessels. And that exchange of gases is called external ventilation. Once the blood has picked up the gases, then it needs to move to the tissues to transport the gases to the tissue. And that's often called transfer of gases. Once the blood vessel reaches the tissues, there no, must then be exchange of gases <clears throat> from the blood vessel into the tissue. And that exchange is called internal respiration. So again, these are four processes or functions that the respiratory system has to carry out in order to, to uh, carry out its roles. So let's take a look at the anatomy now. The only visible organ of the respiratory system is the nose, at least from the outside of the body. So as air enters the respiratory system, it enters through the external nares, also known as the nostrils, and from there it spreads out into the nasal cavity, which is this whole region. From the nasal cavity, it passes into the pharynx, also known as the throat, and then down into the larynx, also known as the voice box, then into the trachea, and the trachea then splits into the primary bronchi, the right and left bronchus, and from there it splits into the secondary and tertiary and quaternary, and keeps splitting into smaller and smaller tubes until it eventually ends up as the alveoli, which are the, the balloon-like structures across which gas exchange occurs. So all of the organs in the respiratory system can be placed in one of two categories. The first category is called the conducting zone. And the purpose of the conducting zone is to uh, purify, warm, and add water to incoming air. And transport. Can't leave out transport. So the structures in the respiratory system that are part of the conducting zone include the nose, nasal cavity, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and terminal bronchioles. So again, their role is just to conduct the air, to transport it. It is not gas exchange. It's the structures in the respiratory zone that have the role of gas exchange. So this is where the gases diffuse And these consist of the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. And by the word bronchiole, if you see I-O-L-E at the end of the word, that means tiny bronchi. All right, so let's take a closer look at the structures in the upper respiratory tract. So as air enters the respiratory system through the external nares, it first enters something called a vestibule. And a vestibule is actually a chamber. So in this vestibule are mucous membranes, um, which are secreting um, 
water, there's sweat glands, there's sebaceous glands secreting oil, and there's large hairs. And so any large particles in the air that's coming into the respiratory system get trapped here. Next, the air is going to move on into the nasal cavity, which actually the vestibule is part of. But it's going to move further into the cavity. And I should mention that in the nasal cavity, there is a wall that divides the two parts of the nose. And that wall is called the nasal septum. So again, a nasal septum, septum means wall. And this consists of a wall of bone that separates the nasal cavity into a right and left side. The nasal cavity is also separated from the oral, oral cavity. Here's the oral cavity right here. That's basically your mouth. And there's your tongue. Here's the tongue, which is pretty big. So the nasal cavity is separated from the oral cavity by the palate. And the anterior part of the palate is made of bone. So you can see right here, that's called the hard palate. That's made of bone. And if you remember from AMP1, the anterior part of the hard palate is, is the palatine process of the maxilla bone. The anterior, the posterior part of the hard palate is called the palatine bones. But the bottom line is this is bone. If you look at the a little bit more towards the back right here, that's called the soft palate. And that also separates the nasal from the oral, oral cavity. The soft palate is made of, um, is not made of bone, and that's made of cartilage. OK, if we go back to the nasal cavity here again, um, the nasal cavity has in it something called conche. I'm going to write this right here, conche. OK, this is in the, in the nasal cavity. Um, and you'll notice here the word concus. There's three. There's superior, there's middle, and there's inferior concha. Um, concha are just area, or conche are area where, it's, where there's inward projections of the nasal cavity. So the mucous membrane bulks out into the cavity. And it ends up forming um, these narrow passageways for the air to flow in. So in other words, I'm just going to write up here, instead of having a straight chute, let's make believe these are the nostrils, and this is the pharynx back here. Instead of having a straight passageway for the air to go through, what you end up having because of the conche, this is the same passageway, is you have these, oops, sorry about that, you have these indentations. So this is where the walls of the mucous membrane extend inward. So when the air comes through, what happens instead of a straight path is it, it forms these, it, it kind of swirls around like this because it hits the conche. And what the conche do, what their role, I'm going to write it here, the role of the conche is to increase the turbulence. It increases the turbulence. Um, that means it causes the air to swirl around. And when that happens, heavier particles in the air fall out. And as they fall out, they land on the mucous membrane and get stuck. And that way, they don't get further into the respiratory system where they can cause damage. So again, the purpose of the conche is to increase turbulence in the nasal cavity. It causes the air to be shooken up, to shake up, kind of like forms little tornadoes. So heavier particles, oops, sorry about that, heavier particles in the incoming air land on 
the conchae, which are lined with a mucous membrane, and they get stuck there. And then eventually, they get blown out of the nose, so they don't make it deeper into the cavity. Okay, let's see if there's anything else here. So let's say that the air now has gotten to the back of the nasal cavity, and it enters the first part of the pharynx. Now the pharynx is basically a long muscular tube, and there are three parts. One part is called the nasopharynx, and you'll notice the nasopharynx is just posterior to the nasal cavity. It's behind the nasal cavity. The next part is called the oropharynx, and you'll notice the oropharynx is just posterior or behind the oral cavity. And lastly, you have the laryngopharynx, which is just posterior or behind the larynx. So let's go back now and look a little bit at that nasal cavity. Let's look at the tissue that lines it. Because the nasal cavity is lined with two types of mucous membrane. Two types of mucous membranes. The first type is called the olfactory mucosa. And it contains re receptors for smell, so this was, which is what allows us to have the sense of smell. The other mucous membrane is called the respiratory mucosa. And this is actually lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. This type of tissue, the pseudostratified, is a very common tissue type found throughout the uh, respiratory system. It contains mucus and serous glands, and in the mucus and the serous glands, you end up secreting about one quart per day of fluid into the nasal cavity. One quart per day of fluid. Think about a quart of milk, and that's about how much fluid that you have. In this fluid, there are lysozymes, and we've talked about this before. But lysozymes are enzymes that will break down the wall of bacteria and destroy them. Okay, so let's move on to the pharynx, better known as the throat. Now by the time air gets to the pharynx, all of the larger particles have been removed. So the largest particle that can make it to the pharynx is about 4 microns in diameter. If you're wondering how big that is, one micron is equal to 10 to the minus 6 of a meter. So take a yardstick, and if I said divide the yardstick into a million sections, put a million little lines on it, one of those lines is a micron. It's very small. So again, the pharynx is a muscular passageway, which is going to connect the nasal cavity and the oral cavity to the larynx and the esophagus. There's three regions of the pharynx, which we've already pointed out. There's the nasopharynx, which is posterior to the nasal cavity. There's the oropharynx, which is posterior to the oral cavity. And then there's the laryngopharynx, which is posterior to the larynx. Only two of these regions can have food and air in them. Could be a passageway for food and air. And this would be the oral pharynx. And the laryngopharynx. Or the laryngopharynx. And to help with this a little more, um, let's take a look again at, at that. Okay. So again, you'll notice the mouth. So as you ingest food, it could enter the oropharynx, could be in that region, and it could also be in the laryngopharynx. Likewise, if you inhaled air through the same pathway, it could also be in those two regions. But food should really not come up into the nasopharynx. It should not be there. Um, sometimes when people are doing two things at once, so let's say they're drinking soda and they're laughing at the same time. 
what happens is the soda can be pulled up into the nasopharynx and come out your nose. And if that's ever happened to you, that's quite unpleasant. What protects that from happening is this little structure here, which is called, sorry, this structure here, called the uvula. This is it right here. I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. The uvula. So the uvula, um, the way that works, oops, sorry, let's see if I can get this to work a little better. Okay, well, <laughs> all right, I'm just going to erase this here, a little bit messy, and show you again that this is the uvula right here. So the way the uvula works is it hangs back at the back of your throat. You can probably see it if you look in the mirror. And when you swallow food, it comes up like this. And it blocks that passage so that food can't get into the nasopharynx and can't get into your nasal cavity. But when you're laughing or talking and swallowing, sometimes the uvula spasms and it can't close off that area. And that's how um, liquids get up into the nasal cavity. A couple other things you might notice now is air leaves the nasal cavity and enters the pharynx, it's going to encounter tonsils. And remember, tonsils are part of the lymphatic nervous system. So there's three tonsils here. There's the pharyngeal right here. These are also known as the adenoids. And then we have the palatine tonsil, which is right here. And then lastly, we have the lingual tonsil, which is right here. So the role of the tonsils is to trap and destroy pathogens. So again, the pharyngeal tonsil, the palatine, and the lingual are going to interact with pathogens in the air and trap and destroy them. Sometimes, if people have a constant uh, and constant infections, the, the tonsils will swell up. And if they can, if they swell up too much, they can block the passageway, uh, the nasal passageway. And that can often result in snoring, which is how a lot of parents know their kids um, have a tonsil problem. So let's move on to the larynx, which is the, ne the next place the air is going to move, sorry, into the larynx. So the larynx is actually this area right here, the larynx. Okay, so the larynx is also called the voice box, and it has three roles. The first role is to provide an open airway. That means that when you breathe in and out, there are tremendous pressures created within the, uh, the air passageways. Because the larynx is made of nine cartilages, eight of them which are very rigid, it holds that airway open. The next thing that the larynx does is it routes air and food into the proper channels. So air gets routed into the trachea, food into the esophagus. And lastly, it plays a role in speech. Now of the nine cartilages, that make up the larynx. As I said, eight are made of hyalin, which are fairly rigid. One is made of elastic cartilage, which actually can stretch and snap back. If you look at the larynx, the, the largest piece of cartilage is the thyroid cartilage. And it looks, the way I identify it, is it looks kind of like a shield. That's how I identify it. Um, there's a part of it that protrudes anteriorly, right about here, it kind of sticks out, and that's called the Adam's apple. It's also known as the laryngeal prominence. Another part of the larynx includes the epiglottis. Epiglottis is made of elastic cartilage, and the job of the epiglottis is to route food to the esophagus and air to the trachea. So let's take a picture, sorry, let's take a look at the larynx. The larynx starts at the hyoid bone and it ends at the, the top three rings of the trachea. 
So this entire picture on this page is the larynx. And you'll notice um, uh, the hyoid bone, you might remember the hyoid bone from A and P1, is not attached to any other bone. What is attached to the hyoid bone are muscles of the tongue and the neck. So this is an anterior view here. And in this view, you can see um, the thyroid cartilage, which again I think looks kind of like a shield. You can see the Adam's apple, which in AMP circles is called the laryngeal prominence. Um, you can see the cricoid cartilage right here, which you had to identify on the model. And the first couple of rings of the trachea. So again, the entire thing is the larynx. And then I missed the, the epiglottis on top. Now the opening for the air is right behind the epiglottis. In, on, on B, we're, what we're seeing here is a lateral view of the larynx. And the reason this is helpful is that you can see the vocal cords, the true and false vocal cords. Um, so the vocal cords are actually places where the mucous membrane of the larynx bulks out into the center, into the lumen. If we start with the false vocal cords, the false vocal cords are superior. So they're above the true. And they consist of a thick mucous membrane which covers fibrous tissue. So again, they consist of a thick mucous membrane which covers fibrous tissue. So you might remember from AMP1 that fibrous tissue is pretty hard. It's rigid. So what happens is, is when the air passes through the larynx and by the false vocal cords, they don't vibrate because they're rigid. So the false vocal cords don't have anything to do with speech. And that's why they're called false. But they do have a job, and their job is to help close the glottis. And I'm going to show you the glottis in a minute. It's the opening. And the other job of the false vocal cords is to keep food out of the trachea. So I'm going to put this down here. Keeps food out of trachea. So that's the false vocal cords. And if you did the dissection in the cat, you will have already seen that. The true vocal cords, I'm going to put true over here, true vocal cords are inferior, they are below the false, and they consist of a thin layer of mucous membrane, oops, sorry about that, oops, I don't think I'm going to be real, thin layer of mucous membrane um, covering elastic tissue. Okay, so that is the true vocal cords. Now, elastic tissue is not very rigid, so when the air passes the true vocal cords, they vibrate and produce a sound, and that's where speech comes from. So let's take another look here, and what we're doing is we're looking down the larynx. So if we had a little camera that we could thread down the larynx, this is what it would look like. At the top here, you can see that's the back of the tongue. The epiglottis here is actually coming straight out at, it, at you. So imagine it's standing straight up, coming straight at you. Um, and you'll notice that the true vocal cords are, look like they're towards the center, even though they're not. They're inferior, and they're white. The false vocal cords look like they're lateral on the sides, and they're red. Um, the true vocal cords are white because they don't contain blood vessels. So what happens is, when you're breathing, the epiglottis is straight up. So during breathing, the epiglottis is straight up, standing straight up. And so that's the situation over here. We're breathing, epiglottis is up, and the glottis is the opening that the air is going to go through. And you'll notice what happens is that
the vocal the vocal cords pull back so that air can go through. So they're going the air is going to vibrate the true vocal cords because they only have elastic cartilage and that creates the sound. When we swallow food, what happens here, swallowing food over here, is that the epiglottis comes over and covers the opening to the larynx. So it comes downward and um, the vocal cords close off and it's the false vocal cords that help to close the glottis. So how does this happen? Well, when you swallow, there are ex extrinsic muscles of the larynx that pull the larynx up and you can you can try this out yourself put your fingers on your throat where you think your larynx is and swallow and you should feel an upward movement so those are the extrinsic muscles of the larynx pulling it up and as they do the tongue the back of the tongue pushes the epiglottis down it covers the entrance to the trachea and that forces the food into the esophagus the esophagus by the way is back here there's the esophagus. So again, if you've closed off the trachea, sorry, you've closed off the larynx, there's no place else for the food to go. It's got to go down the esophagus to your stomach. Okay, so again, during breathing, the epiglottis is straight up. During swallowing, the epiglottis is down, covering the larynx. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to show you this quick picture. This is um, the larynx in a cadaver, and this is a posterior view. So we're looking from behind. You can see the epiglottis up here on top. Um, you can see the cricoid cartilage right here. So in the back, posteriorly, the cricoid cartilage, cartilage is pretty big. Um, this tissue is just muscle covering it, and the trachea starts down below. All right, so we have, the air has moved through the nasal cavity, through the oropharynx, sorry, through the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx, um, through the larynx, and now we're into the trachea, also known as the windpipe. So the trachea is going to connect the larynx to the bronchi. And again, it is lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And that epithelium contains cilia. And you had, to just, you had to look at this on a slide. So you had to look at a slide of the, the trachea and the esophagus and identify both and identify the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Part of this, in, in this area, is something called the mucociliary escalator. And what it is, is that lining the, the uh, trachea is a mucous membrane, which is sticky and gooey. So even though there are not many particles left in the air by the time it gets to the trachea, there st still may be some. So those particles get stuck in the mucus, and then the cilia are all beating in an upward motion, just like an, an escalator. So I guess that's not really an escalator, but it's up, like an up escalator. So the mucus with the particles in it gets beat up and away from your lungs and then usually swallowed or spit out. So either way, it doesn't make it to your lungs. Now the trachea is lined with cartilage rings that are shaped like a C. So let's take a look. Uh, in a minute, we'll look a little closer. The trachea eventually is going to divide into what's called primary bronchi. And the bronchi, where they enter the lungs, there's a little depression called a hilus. The right bronchus, and by the way, bronchus is singular, bronchi is plural, is wider and shorter and straighter than the left. Straighter. And why this is important is that um, because it's wider, shorter, and straighter, it's easier for things to get caught here. So when people choke on food or a coin, sometimes children put a coin in their mouth and they, they it goes down into their um, trachea into their bronchi, it usually gets stuck in the right bronchus because it's easier for it to find its way here. The bronchi now are going to subdivide into smaller and smaller branches. So before we get into that, let's go back and take a look at the trachea. And if we start out here, we're going to take a transverse cut. 
And now here we are, we're looking down into the trachea. So first you'll notice the esophagus right here. And the esophagus is posterior. And if you, if you have done the cat dissection, you'll notice it's attached by connective tissue to the trachea. Um, the esophagus is, often looks collapsed because it doesn't have anything to hold it open. So if there's not food in it, it collapses. And that's why you have this scalloped looking lumen. The trachea, on the other hand, should appear open and round, and that's because it has this layer of hyaline cartilage, which is very rigid and keeps it open. Um, you'll also notice a couple of other things in the trachea. So you'll notice the mucous membrane, which lines the lumen. Remember that mucous membrane is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And you'll also no notice ser seromucous glands in the connective tissue that release serous fluid and mucus. And, um, and one of the things you had to do is look at this under the microscope. So if we look over here to B, um, what you should have found was the pseudostratified ciliated epithelium. Hopefully you can recognize that. Um, the, the mucus, the cilia on the surface um, look kind of like eyelashes. And if you were lucky, you might have seen a goblet cell. A goblet cell is a single-celled gland, and it secretes mucus. And it's that mucus that traps any particles that make that, their way this far into the respiratory tract. Um, you'll notice the hyaline cartilage and also the seromucous glands. I just wanted to show you this picture here of the cilia. And this is from a human. And to me, they look kind of like seaweed. But the, there's many cilia, and they really have an important job, which is to, to grab that mucus and beat it and push it upward away from your lower respiratory tract. In smokers, there's a little bit of an imbalance because the smoke burns away the cilia. And then smokers don't have that protective mechanism. They still have the mucus, but the only way to get the mucus up is by coughing and that's the smoker's cough. The good news is that if smokers stop smoking, the cilia can actually grow back. Um, going just back to the trachea for a minute, you'll notice the rings, the cartilaginous ring is not complete, so it doesn't go all the way around. There's a little area here where there's a tracheallus muscle instead of cartilage. And one of the things the tracheallus muscle will do is that if you, if you get food, caught in your trachea, it will contract this tracheallus muscle. And when it contracts, um, usually through coughing, it can push that food up. So it's a way to help, um, sorry, it's a way to, um, uh, through coughing, to move the food back up and out of the the respiratory trap track. The other thing that it helps with is that if you happen to swallow a large um, bolus, a large ball of food down the esophagus, it can expand into the trachea bit because this area is kind of stretchy. So it allows um, food, it allows, I should say, the esophagus to expand into the trachea. Okay, so it allows the esophagus to expand into the trachea if you happen to swallow a large amount of food. Okay, so what we're going to do next is move on. So we're beyond the trachea, we're beyond the primary bronchi, and now we're into the body of the lungs. So there's a couple of terms on this page that you might want to take a look at, but I'm going to move on to the next picture. And, and talk about them. So here we are. We're going to start here at the trachea. And the trachea comes down and sp splits into the primary bronchus, also called the main bronchus. So there's one on the right and there's one on the left. So keep in mind that this is an anterior view. So this would be the right bronchus and this would be the left. And if you did the cat dissection, you had to find them. After the primary bronchus, it separates right here into the secondary. So there's one secondary, there's another. 
secondary bronchus, also called lobar. And then the secondary splits again into the tertiary or segmental. The tertiary is going to split again into the quaternary, and so on and so on, about 23 times. If you look at the lungs, one of the things you had to um, remember is that the right lung has three lobes. Okay, so you've got the superior, the middle, and the inferior. The left lung has two lobes, and you have the superior and the inferior. Remember, in a cat, it's a little different. So in a cat, there are four lobes on the right, so right is four lobes, and on the left there were three lobes. But there's still more lobes on the right than on the left. Any part of the lung that touches a rib is called a costal surface. And the area where the primary bronchi plunge into the lung is called the hilus because there's a depression there. The pointy part at the top of the lung is called the apex and these words are on the last slide by the way. The bottom of the lung here where it rests on the diaphragm that's called the base. Okay so the one question students had for me was why are there three lobes of, on the right and two lobes on the left? Well if we take a look at this anterior view of a human cadaver you'll notice in the middle here is where the heart is and actually um, what you're looking at is the pericardium, the sac that the heart sits in. But you'll remember that the bulk of the mass of the heart is on the left side of the body. So the reason, so if you look at the left lung, which is right here, there's a little indentation here called the cardiac notch. And that's where the bulk of the heart sits. So the reason there's two lobes on the left is because we need more space on the left side of the thoracic cavity for the heart. Let's take a look at the lungs again, and this is actually a transverse section. So we're looking down into the thoracic cavity. You'll notice here's anterior, here's the posterior part. Um, there's one area here which is called the root of the lung. The root of the lung is where blood vessels and the bronchus enter the lung. I think of it as the root of a plant. Um, the root of the lung plunges in again through the hilus. Um, but one thing you'll, you'll notice here is here's the heart. Remember the heart is in the, in the uh, mediastinum and the lungs are in the pleural cavity. So lungs actually, um, the lungs are surrounded by a serous membrane. And you might remember from AMP1 that a serous membrane is a double layered membrane. It's got two layers. So one layer is going to cover the organ and that's called the visceral layer. So if we look at the lungs um, they try they show you the visceral layer by this reddish line. That's the visceral layer. And I think it's right, yeah, they see the words here, visceral layer. So the visceral layer covers the surface of the organ. In this case I'm going to see, write it up here. It's called the visceral pleura. It covers the lung, the surface of the lung. The other layer lines the cavity and that's called the parietal pleura. So this lines the thoracic cavity. Okay, so you have the the layer again that covers the organ is the visceral layer, the layer that lines the cavity is the parietal. When we talked about the heart, the layer that covered the surface of the heart was called the visceral pericardium. And the layer that lined the cavity that the heart was in was called the parietal pericardium. So it's the same kind of setup. Now in between the two is something called the um, serous uh, sorry, is called the pleural cavity, right here. So the pleural cavity is the cavity between the two layers and it contains pleural fluid, uh, or it's also serous fluid, pleural fluid. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> 
Oh, it's not going to let me write down there. So I'm going to write up here, plural fluid. So the purpose of the plural fluid is twofold. twofold sorry. One, it reduces friction between the two layers. It reduces friction between the visceral and the pleural layer. That's one role. The other role is it allows the lungs to adhere to the walls of the thoracic cavity. Okay, so again, this pleural fluid that's found in the pleural cavity reduces friction between the two layers because the surface of the lung and the walls of the cavity are constantly moving and rubbing up against each other. So if there wasn't some way to decrease the friction, they would start to, um, uh, they'd start to be friction, there'd be damage, they'd adhere to each other, it would be a problem. Um, the other role is to allow the lungs to adhere to the cavities. The lungs are essentially a bunch of small balloons called alveoli with elastic tissue in between. So if you let the lungs um, do what they want, they're going to collapse. Just like if you pull an elastic band, it's going to want to pull into its smallest size. So because the pleural fluid allows that adherence, the lungs move with the thoracic cavity. So let's take another look here. And we'll see again. You can see here's the visceral pleura. It, it covers the lungs. And then the parietal pleura lines the cavities. In between is the pleural cavity, which has in it the pleural fluid, which is also serous fluid. So as the, as the thoracic cavity rises as you inhale, it pulls the lungs up with them, allowing the air to move in. As you exhale and the cavity drops, the lungs get pulled down with it. So lungs are expanding passively. Okay, so let's go beyond the lungs. And, and again, um, as the air enters the primary bronchi, it moves into the secondary bronchi, and then the tertiary, and then the bronchioli and the terminal bronchial. Now the tertiary bronchi are going to continue to split 23 times into smaller and smaller tubes. By the time you get to the bronchioli, they are very small, less than one millimeter in diameter. Sorry, a diameter. And by the time you get to the terminal bronchioli, they are less than 0 0.5 millimeters in diameter. So at this point, you are at the end of the conducting zone. So remember, the conducting zone, its main role is to transport air. It does humidify it and purify it, but there is no gas exchange. One thing that you'll notice as you move from the larger bronchi to the smaller bronchial is that um, there are some tissue changes. So one thing is that happens is as the diameter of these tubes decreases, you find less and less cartilage. Less and less cartilage. So by the time you get to the bronchioli, there is no cartilage in these tubes anymore. There's just some elastic fibers. In addition, the, the type of cell that lines these tubes changes and becomes thinner and thinner. So um, just to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, this is a real human lung where all of the tissue's been removed and all that's been left are the bronchi and bronchioli. And you can see that if you took this part and you turn this upside down, it would look like a tree without leaves. And that's why they call this the respiratory tree. This is hard to see in the cat because you can't, you'd have to dissect the cat out this much. It would be difficult. Um, but it really does look like a tree. Um, the different colors here are divided per um, segments. So not only does the lung have separate lobes, but within the lobes there are separate segments. And if you took, took a look at the sheep pluck in lab, you would notice that the lungs do not all expand at the same time. They expand segment by segment and lobe by lobe. 
So let's take a closer look at the respiratory zone. And again, um, we're down here to the terminal bronchial, which is the end of the conducting zone. And again, by the time we get here, there is no cartilage left. No cartilage. Sorry, that's supposed to say no cartilage. Um, but you do have elastic fibers. And from there, you go into the respiratory bronchioles. Now, even though we're in the respiratory zone, there isn't gas exchange across the bronchioles. The bronchioles then split into alveolar ducts, which you can see down here. And then the ducts balloon out into alveoli. And this is, heat, this is where gas exchange occurs. By the way, alveolus is singular. Alveoli is plural. Um, where you have a bunch of alveoli together, it's called alveolar sac. Now what you do find down here is increased amounts of smooth muscle and you also find that there that the macrophages are down here and they have a more important role than they do in the rest in the rest of the respiratory system. More important role. Okay, so now we're going we're in the respiratory zone in the respiratory zone. And that includes these structures, the respiratory bronchioli, the alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and alveoli. And as I said, this is where gas exchange occurs. On the left, you've got a real picture of um, capillaries and, an, and alveoli in a human. And you'll notice that the capillaries cover the alveoli like a net, and they're in very close contact. There's a very high density of them. So it makes the alveoli look like they're red. On the right, you have an artist's rendition. But again, you've got the alveoli. You have the capillaries. This um, is the smooth muscle. And the yellow that you might see here is our nerves. The alveoli themselves make up most of the mass of the lung even though they're too small to see with your eye. In fact, if you took all the alveoli in the lung and you spread them out, they would cover the surface of one tennis court. So there's a tremendous amount of surface area for gas exchange. Um, and this concludes the end of this lecture. So we're going to stop here and take a quiz.